Welcome to another speaker series event brought to you by the Cultural Knowledge Consortium. The CKC is a joint interagency effort of the U.S. government to support the development of sociocultural knowledge and facilitate knowledge exchange across a range of sociocultural communities of interest. Contact information, the CKC blog, discussion forums, and other resources are available on the CKC web portal at ckc.army.mil. You will also find a link to recordings of all speaker series presentations on the CKC YouTube channel. You may submit questions using the chat, question and answer pod in the lower portion of your screen at any time. We'll respond to as many as time allows. Content of this presentation should not be construed as advocacy, nor representing the views of the CKC or the U.S. government. This presentation is unclassified and intended for public release. Enjoy this presentation. And good morning, folks. This is Jay Hunt, CKC Operations. I'd like to welcome you to our speaker series this morning. Today, we are honored to have our guest, Ms. Kate Onquist Knopp. Uh, she's going to be speaking to us on state society relations in Sudan. Uh, Ms. Knopp is, is the author of Fragility and State Society Relations in South Sudan, and you can see the cover title of that up there in your uh, upper left of your screen, uh, and is an independent consultant on African issues and global development policy. Uh, previously served as an assistant administrator for Africa and mission director for Sudan and South Sudan in the USAID. Uh, Ms. Knopf has represented the U.S. government to the International Assessment and Evaluation Commission, uh, charged with overseeing the implementation of the comprehensive peace agreement between Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, currently, she's an adjunct faculty member at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. So, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest and turn the presentation to, over to Ms. Kate Onquist Knopf. And the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Jay. Thanks very much, everyone, for being online this morning. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, begin. Yeah, I think Jay's already given some background in terms of um, my history on Sudan, which actually you know, extends back to 1995, when I worked for a non-governmental organization, uh, World Vision, and, um, and then subsequently had uh, eight years of deep involvement in the North-South and Darfur peace process uh, during 2001 to 2000, including you know, time as the USAID Sudan mission director. You know, it's been you know, very interesting to sit back and reflect on what's happened in South Sudan uh, since independence two years ago. And uh, I thought what I would do here is uh, walk you through my paper, uh, which the Africa Center for Strategic Studies has published, uh, and to talk a little bit about the current challenges to stability for South Sudan. Uh, give you some background on its path to statehood. Uh, where is it starting from and how did it get there? You know, look at a conceptual framework for understanding uh, the challenges uh, ahead for this new uh, state uh, uh, to um, uh, foil uh, the critics and uh, the skeptics and uh, those who uh, see it as nothing but a failed state. Uh, what, what are the you know, learnings that we have from other experiences around the world about how violence ends and how states can uh, come out of conflict and um, uh, be successful in uh, building a stable uh, democratic uh, uh, framework for their people you know, to live in. And so uh, in that regard, then we'll look at what some specific priorities for South Sudan are going forward. Okay, so uh, the current challenges to stability in South Sudan, you know, I contend uh, emanate from very weak state society relations. You know, these include ethnic tensions and outright violence, uh, between uh, 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 ethnic and identity groups, uh, most uh, particularly uh, the one that's been in the news uh, all summer long has been in Jonglai State, uh, but that is not the only uh, uh, inter-ethnic um, uh, conflict uh, taking place in South Sudan right now. Uh, it's just the most visible and, and prominent one at the moment. Another set of challenges to South Sudan's stability uh, comes from predatory actions or self-inflicted wounds uh, uh, by the state. Uh, uh, and what I mean by this uh, is a whole range of um, security actions from the disarmament campaigns by the army, known as the SPLA, uh, against uh, uh, communities trying to uh, uh, deal with and address the, the ethnic violence that's ongoing. Uh, this has uh, uh, morphed into um, full-on counterinsurgency campaigns, such as is taking place in Jonglai State. Uh, it's also a set of um, uh, actions by the state on um, uh, civil and political rights uh, for citizens of South Sudan. And this includes uh, uh, some 
you know, very disturbing harassment of journalists and uh, outright attacks and, and even assassinations of uh, some very prominent journalists over the past year or so, as well as human rights camp uh, advocates and uh, other civil society organizations. Um, as well, uh, everyone is probably aware that South Sudan has a, a very um, uh, high reputation, uh, reputation for high levels of corruption, and uh, this is indeed an ongoing challenge uh, in terms of how the government is behaving and carrying out its functions as a new state. And then thirdly, we have uh, increasingly centralized power in the executive, and we saw this manifest over the summer, uh, specifically uh, in an internal uh, leadership fight uh, within the ruling party, the SPLM, uh, and uh, that led to the dismissal of the vice president and a wholesale uh, dismissal of the cabinet and uh, a reshuffle there. You know, these, uh, there are some other worrying trends in terms of um, the president dismissing several of the state governors uh, and um, uh, actions that are you know, perhaps uh, seen as um, pulling power in rather than uh, diffusing it out and, and sharing it across the state. So these are all very worrying trends. Here, uh, the chart that you see there is you know, from the failed states index for 2013. This is the first year that you know, South Sudan can fully be ranked uh, in terms of the collecting of data and indicators. The colored bars down below, you know, not to worry about them, but what that means, you know, since most of them are, are up to the top of the charts, is that uh, South Sudan, according to um, the Fund for Peace and Foreign Policy, which put out this index, is the fourth worst uh, failing state uh, in the world uh, based on, on these standard indicators. So um, not, uh, not a terribly encouraging start at the moment. <clears throat> okay, so South Sudanese uh, are also not very happy uh, with the direction that their country is heading. Uh, the graph, uh, the chart on the Left side of the, the slide here uh, it reflects um, an uh, opinion poll that the International Republican Institute did earlier this uh, year. And um, the red bars, I'm sorry the key didn't to show up there, uh, means the dissatisfied, they're not happy with the direction of the country, and the blue bars uh, mean uh, happy or satisfied. So you can see from September uh, 2011, just after independence in July of 2011, uh, uh, till now, you know, the red part is uh, growing and uh, reflecting that uh, more people in the country are dissatisfied with the direction of the country than are satisfied. However, the same opinion poll found that you know, more people report their quality of life has improved uh, since uh, independence. And so you know, we do have um, some mixed you know, responses here. Um, what are the reasons that uh, South Sudanese feel their country is headed in the wrong direction? Well, the, the most significant one is the level of crime and, and security that still persists across the country. Uh, and then uh, the, the next most important factors have to do with you know, um, uh, socioeconomic livelihoods and the ability to um, provide food and sustenance uh, for, uh, for families and um, individuals across South Sudan, which remains a great challenge for, for this very poor country. I think it's important that um, we step back and, and look at where South Sudan was at independence in order to understand uh, the context for you know, the current challenges to stability in South Sudan and, and why state society relations are you know, where they're at, you know, at this you know, very low point. So South Sudan became independent on July 9th uh, of 2011. And this was the result of uh, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which was you know, signed in January of 2005 and then led to a, a six and a half year um, period of uh, interim period uh, of uh, uh, joint uh, government of national unity rule with uh, Khartoum and the referendum in, in January of 2011, in which the people of uh, South Sudan voted overwhelmingly to secede from the country. So at this point in time, uh, South Sudan you know, became uh, an independent state, uh, the newest one in the world, um, with extremely limited you know, physical and human capacity, you know, having been through 38 years of civil war. Sudan, you know, the country became independent from you know, Britain and you know, Egypt colonial rule in 1956. You know, and you know, even from before that time, 1955 to 1972, South Sudan, you know, South Sudan was at war with the North you know, in the civil war. There was a break between 72 and 83. And then the second civil war, you know, went from 1983 to 2005. 
So um, there was very little to, to work with in terms of both the physical infrastructure across this country and um, uh, education. And as you can imagine, you know, human capacity um, also uh, was, was quite decimated. Uh, this, uh, uh, not surprisingly, uh, also means that governance capacity was extremely limited. Uh, at independence, uh, there was very little to draw on in terms of um, uh, colonial administration, uh, going back uh, to the 50s and, and earlier, uh, and then throughout the war, uh, both wars, um, very little civil administration took place across southern Sudan. Uh, as well, you know, social capital uh, amongst groups, uh, ethnic groups, and, and other identity groups in South Sudan uh, was extremely low, uh, given you know, all of the challenges of the war and uh, the internal South-South fighting that took place you know, alongside the North-South fighting uh, of the Civil War. Uh, and then finally, you know, at Independence, we still had uh, a number of uh, very significant outstanding issues uh, with Sudan, uh, unresolved issues from the Covenants of Peace Agreement or the CPA, uh, and many of these uh, still remain today, and we can talk about them a little bit later in the presentation. So uh, here we are, South Sudan. Uh, I, I use this uh, map to show um, uh, how the, what the, the country looked like before uh, separation, and then uh, you can see uh, that uh, uh, South Sudan from the January 1, 1956 line of demarcation, uh, uh, the part that is now separate. So it's about a third of the country you know, from before um, separation. There are approximately 11.4 million people in South Sudan today. Uh, and we can see from the statistics on, on the slide here that, um, uh, the, as I said, the human capacity and, and level of uh, physical uh, development is, is really quite low. For comparison with the United States, uh, South Sudan is uh, about the same size geographically as Texas. Uh, it only has one paved highway uh, extending from the capital, Juba, down to the border of uh, Uganda. Um, and that's about 120 miles long. South Sudan, uh, when it seceded, it took with it <coughs> excuse me, 75 percent uh, of the country's, excuse me, one Sorry about that. Um, it took with it 75% of the uh, combined country's oil production, and this represents about 350,000 uh, 350, um, barrels per day of oil. Uh, and uh, this has been the subject of uh, much contention uh, since separation um, uh, due to the fact that the oil pipeline uh, for export runs, uh, let me see if I can use my pointer here, it runs. Uh, from the oil fields in, in these areas along the border uh, and then up you know, to Port Sudan to export. So you know, the South needs the North to export its oil and um, you know, uh, uh, vice versa, the North needs the revenues from uh, the oil pipelines there. Um, this map now, you know, I know is very busy and uh, hard to, to uh, uh, read. Uh, it's not important, uh, the words on the map. Uh, it's, uh, as you can tell, a distribution of ethnic groups across South Sudan uh, and uh, represents um, sort of a visual uh, uh, impression. Uh, each different color, um, is a, a, each color represents a, um, a different, uh, there we go, it's a little bit larger. Thank you, Jay. Um, represents a different ethnic group, and it just gives you a sense of you know, how complex uh, the social relations and intercommunal relations are in southern Sudan, and um, uh, how many different uh, community groups uh, uh, and ethnic groups there are uh, to work with there. Um, so, uh, in all, uh, South Sudan uh, is coming into its moment of uh, statehood uh, with a really considerable challenges and, and a deep, deep uh, legacy. Um, of uh, a destruction, you know, both physical uh, and um, sociological, and uh, uh, in terms of human capacity from you know, all its uh, years of war. Yeah. However, you know, my contention is that uh, South Sudan is not uh, doomed to, to be a failed state. Uh, that, uh, in fact, um, when we understand where it's coming from and when we look at the literature on how violence ends and uh, what uh, state building entails, uh, there are reasons uh, for, um, uh, for some hope uh, and uh, I think uh, a constructive way forward. 
So the empirical uh, uh, research on um, state formation and ending violent conflict, I think, is um, most uh, usefully summarized or synthesized in the 2011 World Development Report uh, put out by the World Bank. Uh, this one was on conflict security and development. And uh, this uh, uh, illustration that you see here uh, represents um, uh, their, uh, uh, their synthesis that they came to from uh, looking at uh, all this different literature across uh, political science, uh, sociology, um, uh, all the different ways that uh, uh, we study uh, violence and, and how it comes to an end. So the key points from this uh, research uh, study uh, are that violence will continue and state formation will be stymied so long as there is a lack of institutions to manage the competing interests in a society nonviolently. Yeah. And so institutions uh, are key. And Jay, maybe you can make this one a little bit bigger for us too. Yeah. Institutions are, uh, are the key to um, to managing these relationships. Uh, and uh, in order to build institutions, the confidence must be restored. And then that uh, can lead to collective action that helps to transform institutions and, and uh, creates this uh, upward uh, spiral here that you know, most importantly, the World Development Report found uh, leads to improved citizen security, uh, justice, and jobs uh, as the uh, uh, first order priorities for you know, a, a, a state, a society coming out of conflict and trying not to you know, fall back into that. Um, institutions, however, you know, take time to build. You know, you know, in, in fact, they take generations and uh, they require trust and confidence um, to agree on the rules of the game that you know, the institutions embody. So we're not just talking about the formal uh, infrastructure uh, of a government, you know, but we're talking about uh, the way state and society relate to each other um, across um, both political and economic and uh, sociological uh, ways. Inclusion uh, is uh, 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 very important, meaning that the same rules apply to all in society, regardless of their wealth, their race, their gender, geography, et cetera, uh, and also accountability. Um, the fact that there are robust uh, state society uh, based mechanisms to hold those in power in check uh, are, are what's key. So we can represent this or show this a little bit differently here now with this slide. Uh, so what we're trying to do is um, move from a situation of uh, a dominant executive, uh, as we have um, on the left side here. Uh, this uh, uh, more or less represents the situation we have in uh, South Sudan right now. And we want to move to one of layered accountability, uh, where we see these rings of um, <coughs> of uh, uh, robust uh, um, mechanisms that uh, hold those in power in check. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a way of understanding what people want from the state and what the state needs from its people uh, and to, uh, to facilitate uh, those dialogues and, and uh, understandings and institutions to develop. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in order for that to happen, there must be greater trust and confidence uh, in the state uh, and uh, the state uh, must, uh, uh, those in power, uh, especially in the executive, must subject themselves uh, to being accountable to the people. So the pr principal task for you know, the government of South Sudan is to engender trust in it and not to alienate or disappoint its citizens further. Uh, this means undertaking confidence building measures that reinforce its accountability to its people. And there are a variety of mechanisms they could be doing this through. Uh, these include constitutions and elections, independent uh, legislatures and courts, you know, political parties, you know, decentralization of government, you know, uh, creating a more professional security sector, and a merit-based civil service. And these are some of the formal mechanisms of accountability. And of course, they do take time to develop. So in the, the interim, particularly for uh, a case like South Sudan, society-based mechanisms may be even more important uh, to bringing this accountability uh, and uh, starting this process of restoring confidence or building confidence between the state and society. Um, this uh, then entails uh, uh, the outer ring here that we see on the layered accountability uh, uh, illustration. Uh, these are things uh, such as civil society, um, having access to independent information and freedom of the media, 
you know, the state can also borrow social capital from you know, non-state actors that are you know, well um, respected and, and trusted by the people. You know, for instance, in South Sudan, this would uh, you know, likely be the churches and, and some traditional leaders. And uh, uh, by working together you know, with them, uh, the state can, can earn confidence and you know, increase uh, it, the trust that people have in it as well. And then also external norms and standards are, are another important source of you know, uh, accountability, you know, particularly in the early stages. Unfortunately, where we're at right now uh, in South Sudan, uh, uh, the trend lines uh, across all these um, different methods of accountability or mechanisms uh, of accountability uh, are, are not uh, trending in a, in a positive direction, you know, both in terms of the government's actions uh, around the formal mechanisms of accountability, you know, developing um, <clears throat> the checks and balances that would be inherent uh, in uh, a robust, uh, uh, inclusive, uh, resilient uh, state. Uh, uh, those are uh, not uh, moving forward at the moment, whether we look at uh, the constitutional process or elections or you know, the independence of the legislature or the judiciary. Um, clearly, there are challenges with the security sector reform at the moment uh, and uh, with the streamlining uh, the civil service uh, and, and the government across the board. Uh, as well, um, on the social accountability side, um, as I said earlier, there are already uh, uh, worrisome trends in terms of harassment by the government of the civil society, of you know, the media, of human rights organizations, and you know, um, allowing space for, um, <clears throat> for these mechanisms to develop and, and uh, to be independent sources of information and dialogue and discussion on, on what's happening in the state. Um, uh, in terms of uh, working with the churches, uh, the, the government of South Sudan actually uh, uh, does uh, seek to work with uh, uh, key church leaders, uh, and uh, we can see this in a number of reconciliation processes that have uh, um, started to take place across South Sudan. And so that's one positive uh, area that, uh, that more could be uh, built upon. But overall, uh, how can we reverse you know, the negative trends that are underway right now so that uh, South Sudan does not uh, uh, indeed fulfill the prophecy of being a failed state. Uh, instead, uh, how does it become uh, a more uh, inclusive and um, representative and uh, democratic uh, and uh, stable country? Well, there are three ways uh, principally to reverse uh, this trend. Um, and uh, drawing on the literature of how violence ends and how uh, resilient states uh, come into being. Uh, these, these are the key points uh, that come through um, for South Sudan. Uh, the first is to build more inclusive coalitions, um, meaning partnerships uh, to support governance reforms. Uh, this means uh, even greater engagement with uh, societal actors, uh, such as the churches and traditional leaders and civil society organizations. You know, to reach out to local communities that can help to establish security, you know, that can help to conduct political processes. You know, this, in fact, is how the referendum was able to be held so successfully, was the joint partnership between the state and you know, societal actors. And, and also, it helps to better identify development needs and priorities of communities. You know, most importantly, you know, building more inclusive coalitions to, to support reform means that you know, communities such as the Moale uh, population in, in Jongwai State, uh, cannot feel targeted by the state. Uh, and uh, we see some very uh, worrisome um, trends in terms of uh, vilifying uh, this whole community for the um, insurgency and the violence that's taking place right there. Uh, that needs to stop uh, if uh, the Moale are, are to feel part of, of their uh, country and uh, to uh, enter into the political process and, and uh, have feel that they're um, included in the state as well and, and that their only recourse is not to, uh, to violence. Secondly, we need to expand the space for independent voices uh, within South Sudan. You know, and this uh, should entail uh, a massive civic education campaign to sensitize the population to key democratic values and principles, such as the civic uh, participation responsibility of all citizens, you know, um, the imperative of freedom of speech and tolerance of opposing views, equality before the law, and protection of private property. Um, some of these things are, are understood and, and valued and appreciated uh, within South Sudan, uh, but for, for many people, 
for um, uh, and and their knowledge of uh, the uh, of a constitutional uh, government of uh, what their um, uh, what their role is in this uh, relationship with the state is is very very limited, uh, and uh, what they would like to see uh, from their state uh, is also you know, something that needs uh, much more dialogue and uh, discussion uh, nationally and uh, within communities uh, down to the lowest level. Um, the government should facilitate this and encourage it, uh, and instead, uh, what we see are um, signs of uh, trying to uh, control the discussion and um, to uh, limit uh, the conversation about uh, how the, the state uh, and, and society should relate to each other. So uh, it's important that the government not try to monopolize uh, uh, state society relations through you know, harassment of independent sources of information, that instead they allow the media to do their job, uh, and uh, that uh, overall there is a um, a focus on building a national identity that moves beyond the common struggle for self-determination uh, that brought them to, to July of 2011. Uh, thirdly, uh, the state needs to demonstrate uh, its responsiveness to citizen priorities, and I think there are three important opportunities to do this uh, going forward in the next uh, year or two, uh, looking towards 2015. Uh, uh, these uh, uh, there are, present uh, strategic opportunities for the government to generate confidence in the state and to advance uh, the building of inclusive and accountable institutions. So these three processes are the national constitutional review process, the national reconciliation process, and uh, uh, elections uh, which should take place in 2015, uh, although there is some uncertainty about that at the moment. Um, the National Constitutional Review Process uh, is uh, mandated to, to, um, to uh, draft a, a new permanent constitution uh, for South Sudan. Uh, they entered into statehood with a transitional constitution uh, built off of an interim constitution uh, that was uh, put into place uh, once uh, the government of Southern Sudan uh, was stood up under the, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. It's now time for, for all the people of, of South Sudan to participate uh, again in this national dialogue about um, what they want from their governments, uh, how they would like it to be structured, uh, how state and federal government and local government will relate. You know, all the key foundational uh, requirements uh, here must be broadly discussed and owned by the people, the citizens of South Sudan. Uh, this uh, constitutional review process is um, behind schedule and uh, so far, um, primarily an elite-driven uh, exercise from Juba, uh, in, uh, the, which is the capital of South Sudan. Uh, but there is still time for, for the government to, to turn this around, to make it a much more inclusive process, and to use it as a vehicle you know, for having this dialogue and discussion. As well, there's uh, a process that's just uh, getting underway for national reconciliation. Uh, as I mentioned briefly earlier, you know, there was uh, an intense level of South-South fighting uh, within ethnic groups you know, during the Civil War. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, some accounts uh, suggest that more violence and, and uh, destruction came from the South-South fighting than from direct North-South fighting. You know, and so there's a lot uh, of uh, uh, need for uh, reconciliation uh, in order to restore social cohesion and you know, improve uh, relations across uh, South Sudan, uh, not just with the state. Uh, and as well, of course, uh, many of the key figures from um, from uh, the Civil War, uh, leaders of the different factions of rebel movements uh, are now uh, prominent figures in the government, and, and so this further you know, complicates the, the reconciliation challenge and also points to uh, its imperative for the state to move forward. <clears throat> and then finally, elections. Um, the president, uh, the federal and national level elections and state level elections, uh, as well as the local elections, it should take place in 2015. Uh, the, the president, Salva Kiir, uh, is currently serving a five-year term from elections in 2010, so before independence took place. Um, however, uh, there are some uh, significant challenges to elections uh, taking uh, place uh, on schedule in 2015, uh, having to do with both um, political struggles within the, the um, ruling SPLM party, as well as um, uh, logistical and administrative challenges 
of administering the elections. But uh, again, this could be an opportunity for you know, bringing the country together rather than being a zero-sum uh, process you know, that leads to more conflict and, and instability. You know, getting this right uh, would, would be very important for South Sudan. And then finally, um, I have a, a, an addendum point here on extending roads and radio across the country because none of these uh, three priorities uh, uh, can take place. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, no uh, um, extension of government services or provision of security can really happen so long as the country remains um, as cut off and, and so disconnected as it is, both physically and uh, from a communications perspective. And Jay, if you can um, pop this map up for us, you know, because uh, it's even more challenging to read, you know, I, I realize that uh, what this represents is a, a map that the humanitarian community you know, uses in South Sudan to, um, to uh, uh, track uh, uh, road access, uh, land access uh, to different communities across the country. And you can see from you know, one how few lines there are uh, across, uh, again, this is uh, a territory about the size of Texas, how few brown lines are, there are represents how few roads, and these primarily mean dirt roads that you know, get flooded out you know, during the rainy season every year. Uh, and, and then the red lines here are showing us, you know, in fact, uh, just how many of those uh, key arteries are impassable at the moment, uh, and therefore populations are, are wholly out of reach uh, from uh, government, from security, from the international humanitarian community, uh, requiring very expensive um, uh, air mobility uh, where, uh, when and where there's possibility even of, uh, of landing uh, helicopters or small aircraft uh, to, to get there. So um, <clears throat> the point of this is just to illustrate uh, how far you know, South Sudan still has to go even in being able to connect you know, uh, to each other, uh, people to each other, and to connect the state to, to the people through any of these processes that I've just discussed or any other development or humanitarian uh, or state building uh, initiative that is required going forward. So uh, in sum, uh, I just uh, I guess would conclude by saying that you know, there's no end to violence in South Sudan without building a stronger and more inclusive and more cohesive uh, uh, relationship between state and society. It is the foundation on which uh, any stable state must be built and can't be an afterthought. Uh, if, uh, if this relationship um, isn't uh, uh, put right uh, from the beginning, you know, then we will continue to see uh, an increasingly predatory, exclusionary, and uh, uh, um, exclusive government uh, dominated by a very strong executive you know, with very little accountability uh, to its citizens. And, um, and this will be you know, fuel for the people of South Sudan to continue to you know, settle their differences and, and resolve issues through the means that they understand, which uh, at the moment is, is uh, often results in violence. It is important, however, for you know, us as outside partners, you know, whether in the United States or the international community, you know, to recognize that state building does take time and institutions develop over generations and that they can't be imported you know, from the outside. You know, I, so even though we see many, many problems and many worrisome trends going on in South Sudan right now, you know, it's for the people of South Sudan to, um, to, to problem solve uh, and uh, to, to decide how they want to address them. You know, we as the outsiders can offer suggestions, we can share experiences from what's happened in other parts of the world. You know, we can you know, make the technical assistance available uh, when it's requested. Uh, and desired, uh, but we can't just give them our institutions that work for us in our context. Uh, and so uh, a little bit of patience and um, some recognition of, uh, uh, of this uh, iterative process that needs to take place is, is important. And then uh, finally for uh, South Sudanese uh, elites uh, who are in charge of the, uh, the government right now and uh, the uh, relations between state and, and society, you know, I, there's a, an oft-repeated phrase in, in Juba that Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, and, and of course, that's true, as I've just said, institutions do take time. But uh, there's also uh, a need for um, a real urgency uh, in terms of putting you know, state-society relations on a more solid footing right now. 
uh, to build the credibility and legitimacy of the state so that inclusive and accountable institutions can take root and so that not to embed uh, these exclusionary and, and predatory practices that will only make uh, this challenge that much harder. So uh, I will stop there. I apologize for my voice. Uh, I'm having a cold right now, so I hope that it hasn't been too difficult to, uh, to, to follow along, but uh, I look forward to your questions and uh, uh, I'm available uh, to start that. Jay. Great, thank you, Kate. And uh, while our audience is uh, entering their questions in the chat box below, I'm I'm chuckling still because uh, the reference to Rome wasn't built in the day uh, struck me as funny, given that the the map you just showed with all the roads and the the status, uh, you know, all roads lead to Rome. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's any roads that lead uh, in any consistent manner here, mm -hmm. particularly up through uh, like the Jungle region where you know, anything that goes sort of to the north and to the, yeah, there you go, mm -hmm. sort of to the north and up onward to east. Uh, as, as again, as the our audience is entering their questions down below, uh, I'm not terribly familiar with this. And could could you maybe explain a little bit on the conflict in Jungle? And maybe I, I already mentioned Dave Yao. Yeah, I don't know anything about him other than uh, he's a, a rebel leader. Uh, could you expand on that just a bit? Sure. Um, so very much in the news over the last few months has been a uh, uh, conflict in Jungle State, which I'm attempting to point to here. So you can see you know, it's over you know, generally in this uh, area. And uh, yes, as Jay just pointed out, there are uh, very few uh, roads uh, of any significance uh, in this whole state. Uh, and in fact, um, for, for much of uh, uh, the year, uh, especially during the rainy season, um, it, uh, it, it's virtually impossible to reach uh, communities except uh, by uh, river uh, and transport. And, and even then, you know, sometimes uh, they're, they're cut off from each other. So um, responding to the conflict and, and the violence that's going on in the state is, um, is challenging to say the least, even uh, with the best of intentions uh, from, from the government and, and the international community. Um, what's happening right now in Zhang Lai State uh, is the, uh, um, a combination of uh, sources of, of violence. Uh, there has been you know, longstanding uh, ethnic rivalries and feuds between uh, several different ethnic groups in the state. Uh, one set of them is between the Moroway population, uh, which uh, is uh, centered around uh, Pibor here uh, in this area, and uh, the Lao Nuer, uh, who uh, uh, occupy other areas of, of Zhongwei states and, and uh, about uh, the Moroway areas, uh, and they have uh, long uh, gone back and forth uh, in um, cattle raiding and you know, uh, sort of ethnic rivalries and, and attacks uh, on each other. You know, these did seem to escalate uh, uh, from about 2009 uh, onward and particularly into to 2011 with some very significant uh, inter-ethnic conflict. Um, at the same time as that, uh, uh, this uh, rebel leader, David Yao Yao, uh, began an insurgency you know, from following his uh, 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 loss in uh, the 2010 elections for a seat in the Zhongwei State Assembly. Uh, and uh, he decided to, to take up his uh, grievances over how that election process was uh, handled um, by um, uh, entering into an insurgency with another rebel leader uh, that has now uh, been um, fueled uh, to some extent with armed supplies uh, from Khartoum. Uh, and uh, and so we have this uh, uh, terrible situation uh, with David Yao Yao, who comes from the Malay population, uh, coinciding <clears throat> with uh, uh, sort of uh, the Lao Nuer and uh, Malay youth in particular, uh, warring back and forth with each other, you know, and it's become a very sort of confused uh, situation. You know, it's been compounded by attempts by the um, the army, the SPLA, to disarm. Uh, uh, the communities at different points in time. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't always been handled um, uh, as, uh, as best as possible. And so some communities have been disarmed while other communities were not, leaving them vulnerable to attacks and uh, uh, um, worsening uh, confidence in, in the state and in the Army's actions in, in terms of uh, what they were trying to achieve there. Uh, and then two, um, uh, earlier this year, the SBLA uh, mounted uh, a pretty aggressive counterinsurgency campaign against uh, David Yao Yao 
and uh, has been full on attacking uh, his forces, which are often hard to distinguish between the Murawai youth. Uh, and as a result, uh, over the summer, we saw uh, virtually the entire Murawai population uh, disappear uh, into uh, the, the swamps and, and sort of the hinterland uh, uh, of their uh, territory in Zhongguai State. Um, you know, there was a pretty significant concern about uh, their humanitarian needs. Uh, and in fact, uh, some 75,000 uh, of them have now been registered for humanitarian assistance and are receiving humanitarian aid at some level. Uh, and there was also significant concerns uh, of, uh, of reports of allegations of human rights abuses uh, coming from uh, the SPLA and uh, their actions uh, in mounting this counterinsurgency campaign. So uh, <clears throat> that uh, kind of went into a hiatus uh, late summer, uh, uh, mid to late summer, uh, due to the rains, making it uh, more difficult for uh, any of this fighting to continue. Uh, but just in, in the last week or two, uh, we've seen um, some fresh attacks uh, reportedly by David Yao Yao uh, and uh, militia aligned to him, uh, which uh, gives um, you know, not a lot of uh, hope for some of the um, peace processes, reconciliation talks that uh, were underway to try and reach out to David Yao Yao and uh, to you know, facilitate a dialogue between the Norway and Yao Yao and the government of South Sudan. So uh, right now we're still stuck, stuck in a cycle of um, violence due to insurgency, as well as to um, inter-ethnic rivalry, which unfortunately has no other way of you know, um, being resolved at the moment uh, due to the lack of you know, any sort of judicial systems or processes uh, at the community level that can handle grievances you know, instead of uh, channeling them through you know, these uh, the more habitual responses of um, uh, violent conflict. It's a pretty very complex uh, situation, and uh, the, our first question from uh, Dr. Claire Metellitz, our own Dr. Metellitz, uh, she mentions that uh, you suggest that the the building trust and accountability piece uh, should be facilitated by foreign actors, international NGOs, governments, or uh, or do you see that the the southern Sudanese taking care of this on their own, and if in either situation, where do you see the, the funding for this kind of trust building uh, process coming from? Well, I, I would start by saying that um, building trust and accountability is fundamentally, um, the action is fundamentally on the South Sudanese themselves and on uh, both state actors as well as you know, um, uh, reformers uh, within the society who are you know, agitating for more, you know, uh, more national dialogue, for more discussion over what's happening you know, in society. If you go online, you can see there is a pretty you know, you know, vibrant debate uh, online. You know, but uh, within you know, South Sudan, the space for journalists to report uh, anything negative about the government or the army's actions is very, very, very thin. You know, I, I, it's extremely limited in, in getting uh, uh, you know, less, uh, um, uh, even less tolerated, uh, uh, it seems. You know, and so you know, I, until or unless the government uh, and key individuals you know, within the government decide you know, to, you know, um, to adopt a different paradigm of uh, not uh, you know, seeing everything as an attack uh, uh, on you know, their existence and their hold on power, but uh, welcoming and supporting and facilitating you know, uh, the political processes that, that need to take place in the country so that uh, people can choose you know, who they would like to, to rule them. Um, then, then that will be very difficult for uh, any of us from the outside um, to, to come along and, and do for them. Um, this is not to say that uh, all depends on the elites. You know, certainly pressure for reform can come from below. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed, um, the attacks on you know, journalists and on human rights organizations haven't stopped. Uh, uh, others from still trying uh, to get information out and, and to still report on government actions. Uh, and what's happening on a whole uh, range of fronts. You know, there are ways that uh, external actors can be supportive of that uh, uh, appropriately and, and uh, quietly you know, um, in terms of uh, you know, providing funding you know, uh, and training, you know, for instance, for journalists, 
you know, supporting civil society organizations you know, so that they can continue to you know, uh, expand uh, uh, their activities and, and their reach across uh, South Sudan, uh, as well as then giving voice uh, uh, and uh, calling out uh, the abuses of the government uh, when necessary. And we saw this take place you know, with the, the diplomatic representation you know, in Juba, uh, really you know, challenging the government of South Sudan about uh, the abuses going on in Zhongwei State uh, as a result of their actions there. And in fact, we started to see a little bit of response and progress to that. Uh, a few uh, soldiers are being held to account for abuses there, uh, uh, probably not nearly enough uh, thus far, uh, but uh, it does show some uh, steps towards uh, uh, bringing accountability there. In terms of what, uh, for instance, could the Department of Defense do, um, uh, security sector reform, you know, uh, it continues to be uh, a huge need there. Uh, and so, you know, the mentoring uh, activities and uh, advising you know, and training you know, that we can uh, provide you know, to South uh, Sudan Armed Forces and Security Services to become more professional, you know, to um, have uh, uh, the ethics and you know, the principles that we you know, would ascribe to you know, in you know, civilian rules, uh, militaries and democratic societies. These are all vitally important you know, processes. And uh, just because there are some worrisome trends uh, going on at the moment doesn't mean we should uh, give up hope on, on uh, what uh, is being gained from those. I, I think there are uh, very much uh, leaders within uh, the army, within the police services who do want to see their institutions reformed and improved and um, getting to know these reformers and supporting them and uh, providing the assistance that they, uh, that they ask for uh, is, is certainly vitally important you know, in terms of what we can do from the outside to, to continue to, to, um, to further that reform process. Well, and these kind of processes that involve external actors and the international community, they're pretty delicate. I saw that there's been a flurry in the last few days about uh, the referendum that the Avie, the folks out in uh, Avie are holding. Uh, somewhat controversial, I guess. I don't know anything about it. I've seen the statements by the, the Sudanese foreign, foreign minister. It says, it's not going to see the light of day. It's not going to get referred to the UN Security Council and as ostensibly the US wants. Um, why, why is this so controversial? OK, uh, good question. Uh, Abie, uh, which I have my uh, green pointer on now, uh, is this the, um, uh, disputed area that sits uh, on the border between uh, uh, Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, it was um, uh, a, a critical uh, issue, uh, uh, the status of it uh, in the negotiation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. And in fact, it was accorded uh, the right to, to hold a referendum for the residents of Abia. You know, to decide whether they wanted to, to follow the people of South Sudan and what they voted to do uh, or to remain you know, united with Sudan. It was meant to have its referendum at the same time as Southern Sudan uh, had its referendum in January of 2011. Yeah, however, uh, Khartoum, you know, the government of Sudan has you know, been uh, obstructing, uh, frankly, uh, since uh, 2005 and the, the peace agreement was signed. Uh, every step of the implementation of this protocol, more or less, and you know, I, uh, the sensitivities around it uh, are um, are difficult, I think, to understand uh, in some ways from the outside, since it's a, a very symbolic region for the uh, Nok Dinka people of um, Abia, who uh, are uh, related to, to uh, uh, the Dinka communities in, in South Sudan and, and very much uh, see themselves as Southern Sudanese. Uh, and uh, one with uh, with their you know, compatriots uh, who are now um, below the uh, what they call the 1956 line that uh, um, is the uh, current uh, demarcation you know, it hasn't been finally demarcated yet here. You know, I, these people you know, I feel you know, I, that they should be part of uh, they sh should be part of Southern Sudan. Essentially, this is a a territory you know, that was you know, um, put under northern administration back in 1905 by, you know, under British colonial rule. 
you know, it was promised several times over the course uh, of the last uh, 100 plus years uh, uh, to be returned to the South or to have a referendum on returning to the South. And each time that's been thwarted uh, for you know, one reason or another. You know, it, it's uh, you know, in some ways you know, is the symbolic um, uh, flashpoint uh, that uh, you know, led to, to the ignition of the, the North South War in 1983. And it remains a, a very sensitive and volatile issue for both South Sudan and, and Sudan. You know, the North Sudanese people um, have become very frustrated you know, over the course of uh, these many promises, and, and particularly since uh, the 2005 the Comprehensive Peace Agreement you know, explicitly afforded them their uh, right to, to a, a referendum on self-determination as well. And uh, the AU Peace and Security Council has been trying uh, the last couple of years to mediate uh, the ongoing uh, dispute uh, between holding the, over holding this referendum between South Sudan and Sudan. Uh, about a year ago, they proposed uh, a, a timeline that uh, said ABA should hold its referendum in October of 2013. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Sudan and South Sudan uh, could not move forward or weren't able to move forward on, on the steps necessary to organize that referendum. Uh, and you know, um, the people of, of ABA have decided to hold their own referendum anyway uh, to express uh, their will to the, you know, to the rest of the world in terms of uh, what they would like for their final status. So that's what's happening right now. You know, um, there's still a stalemate between Khartoum and Juba over what to do with ABA Khartoum. You know, and the North obviously um, uh, are reluctant to, to move any more territory you know, uh, at the point of national pride. There are also you know, uh, northern uh, nomadic tribes uh, in this area that you know, use um, ABA and, as a, a passageway to water points uh, even into South Sudan you know, on an annual uh, basis uh, and, and need that very much for uh, grazing and, and for water for their Herds. And so, um, so it is a, a question of livelihoods uh, for, you know, for these northern populations who are also you know, affected and, and uh, part-time residents as it is you know, in this region. And the full-time residents are, are the Nazinka. Uh, you know, the dispute uh, you know, has come down to you know, who, uh, who can vote in the referendum. The AU Peace and Security Council said that the Nazinka uh, should uh, vote as the full-time residents. Uh, and uh, this is uh, where Khartoum uh, gets stalled uh, and um, displeased with moving forward you know, because they see the Masuria population being left out of that uh, equation there. Yeah. So, you know, so this is where we're at right now. It, it's a, a pretty significant uh, uh, stalemate. It's a very volatile situation. You know, Abia town has been uh, attacked and, and raised uh, several times, uh, even since the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Uh, and uh, it's um, uh, likely, uh, it's, it's possible that uh, this referendum could uh, inform the, the tensions between the communities there and uh, be the excuse or the trigger for uh, another round of, um, of outright fighting there. Um, there is a misperception that the, the issue in Adia is over oil. Uh, and in fact, uh, where once upon a time, uh, earlier in the process, the, the territory was uh, defined uh, to include uh, some of the more significant oil fields uh, between Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, this is not the case any longer. Uh, a permanent court of arbitration in 2009 uh, uh, ruled on the boundaries of the territory of Abia, which has more or less been accepted by both sides. Uh, and uh, it excluded all but uh, one very um, pretty insignificant oil field uh, within the boundaries of Abia. So it's, it's really an issue of um, self-determination for the communities of Abia. It's an issue for uh, uh, ensuring um, uh, both the communities uh, uh, can uh, have the, the access to resources that they need to, for, their, uh, for their own livelihoods and, and to, for their um, sustenance for their families. And then it's a, a point of um, uh, of some national pride for both South Sudan and Sudan, what happens with the final status there. So we're, we're at a, a very unfortunate stalemate in the process.
So with the, the oil situation, uh, that seems to have gotten up to a point of stability. Is what, What's the other piece? I'm not quite getting why uh, Avier is the is the conflict the flashpoint that it could be is it the it, i don't see a, a rail line of communication the roads are a bit dodgy i don't see uh, water resources so aside from the oil is it really a, a symbolic uh, or, or based on the historical crossroads issue uh, what am i missing here um well in fact it, it is the access way to um to water uh, so there are some rivers here that run uh, south of the uh, abia area and uh, uh, this area is uh, uh, very important for grazing uh, for herds uh, coming from the north here uh, down the cross line um, and, and so uh, so that's a, a very um, specific um, uh, economic uh, uh, factor for uh, communities uh, uh, north of ABA uh, for instance but but more importantly I think for people in, in South Sudan and, and for the Nongkinka uh, it, is a, uh, it is a question of you know, self-determination and of you know, being part of the state and, and the country and the, the government that uh, you know, they think uh, best represents them and, and their interests. You know, having been you know, attacked and you know, assaulted uh, for you know, over the course of many, many, many years, you know, I, uh, they uh, have uh, even you know no confidence and, and no trust in the government in Khartoum and um, uh, see uh, essentially that government as their oppressors and uh, attackers and uh, this goes um, this goes back uh, way into to colonial administration uh, uh, in terms of the legacy of grievances and and uh, the desire to be part of southern Sudan and uh, again for a number of reasons over sure. the course of these many years you know, it, it, that's always been thwarted. So it is a, a, a deeply symbolic and uh, important issue, even though for us as outsiders, you know, it's, it's not a very large territory. It doesn't seem that significant in terms of uh, resources and uh, obvious assets. But uh, for the people who live there and claim it as their home, you know, it, it's, it's the most important question they have. Indeed. Okay. Well, thank you. I just appreciate the clearing it up. Uh, in the short time that we have remaining, I wanted to make sure we kind of address some of the, the larger political issue. Uh, it, it seemed like it was back in late July when uh, the, the President uh, Safa Kir uh, dismissed his vice president, uh, I think his name was Makar, and the entire cabinet and uh, just sacked him. Uh, what, what is this leadership fight all about and what, is that, what kind of effect does that have on the instability up in the, in the north? Yes, uh, very important question for the, the three you know, processes I identified going forward is what happens with the leadership in, in South Sudan. You know, I, as I mentioned, uh, you know, President Kier, uh, you know, it should either stand for re-election uh, or you know, step aside in, in 2015 and allow someone else uh, to be elected as president of, of South Sudan, uh, as well as then you know, the National Assembly, uh, state governors, the state assemblies, and um, uh, you know, even the county commissioners uh, are intended to, to be elected uh, uh, by the people. You know, I, the vice president uh, up until uh, July or so uh, of this year uh, was a man named Riak Machar, uh, who led an opposing uh, faction uh, that broke away from the SPLM, uh, the ruling party, that uh, you know, signed a peace agreement with, uh, with Khartoum and, and uh, uh, is uh, seen to have delivered uh, independence uh, for the country. Uh, Riyak Machar uh, led uh, a rival faction uh, to this movement uh, up until uh, uh, midway through the negotiation of, of the peace process, and then he uh, rejoined uh, with John Garang, uh, the leader of the SPLM, who was killed uh, quite tragically in, in a helicopter accident uh, uh, just after the interim uh, government uh, stood up in, in 2005. Uh, upon his death, Salva Kiir, uh, the current president of the country, uh, 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 who had been the vice president, he took over as the president of the government of southern Sudan, and uh, and then uh, was elected, uh, as I said, in 2010, uh, pre-independence. Uh, Salva has not uh, uh, indicated uh, yet uh, if he will uh, run again or not, or I guess essentially he's saying you know, he's not planning to step aside 
even though Riyak Machar, the vice president, has signaled uh, very you know, um, explicitly his desire to run you know, for president of, of South Sudan, as well as a couple of other senior you know, uh, officials and uh, prominent personalities you know, in South Sudan you know, within the SPLM. So they're currently having a, a leadership uh, um, challenge in terms of coming to agreement as a party on who their candidate for president will be, whether it's the incumbent Salva Kiir or uh, one of these other you know, uh, leading figures that uh, would like to contend. You know, and in this context, um, uh, Salva Kiir availed himself of uh, his constitutional you know, uh, ability to dismiss the vice president you know, I, so you know, I, he was within his rights to do that, you know, um, and uh, then he also used that time to you know, um, apologize if there's background noise, you know, uh, to uh, you know, streamline his cabinet, uh, shall we say. So he dismissed the entire cabinet and then reduced the number of ministerial posts and uh, reappointed uh, uh, officials. Uh, many of them, uh, in fact, uh, uh, many of the, the previous cabinet members were not returned to power. So, you know, so there's an ongoing challenge uh, within the SPLM to you know, to resolve their you know, their slate uh, for 2015, and um, you know, so far you know, this is you know, being handled you know, um, you know, in terms of uh, you know, SPLM uh, party processes. Uh, we hope that these will uh, continue to move forward and you know, um, uh, be handled uh, um, peacefully uh, for first and foremost, uh, but uh, as uh, inclusively and transparently as possible so that you know, uh, the party uh, can uh, uh, put forward its slate and uh, uh, also allow space for other political parties in South Sudan you know, to, um, to field their candidates and, and to have uh, a transparent and fair election process going forward. There are many, many challenges to this, you know, the political process uh, and, and you know, leadership discussions being one of them. There should have also been uh, another census uh, in South Sudan by now so that the um, voter registration process and you know, uh, constituencies could be determined uh, before the, the 2015 you know, election timetable you know, needs to, to kick off. You know, many concerns on, on the administration side of the elections as well as the, the political side. Uh, requiring a lot of attention and focus, and, and uh, you know, to answer Claire's question from earlier, again, uh, another space where external actors can be helpful uh, and supportive of um, uh, making these things possible, but ultimately the political decisions are, are on the people in, in South Sudan, uh, and particularly those in power at the moment. Indeed. And uh, again, as we close up here, uh, I always like to hit our speakers with a sort of a one big thought. Uh, for the next six months, what do you see as the one thing that we all should watch for in this conflict area? Um, I, I think in the next six months, uh, what will be critical will, will be, uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, this process within the SPLM of resolving their leadership challenges and moving forward with uh, a number of internal party processes that, uh, again, should have taken place already to, um, to come up with a, a new constitution and uh, different party documents and, and their internal rules and procedures you know, that uh, you know, will be important to, you know, to the elections going forward and, and to them presenting a, a vision and a platform to citizens of South Sudan that they can decide if the, that represents them or, or not. Uh, and as well how they, you know, they choose to you know, encourage and allow you know, broader discussion and alternative voices uh, to come forward, whether in the form of other political parties or uh, just uh, uh, commentary in the press, you know, civil society uh, dialogues and, and discussions, you know, how they reach out across uh, South Sudan you know, in, in the constant context of the national constitutional review process. Um, I think these are, are the most important uh, uh, processes uh, to watch and, and, and to keep the eye on uh, going forward. Uh, what happens uh, in Zhonglai and uh, you know these flare-ups of, of security challenges um, tend to, to draw our, our eyes like moths you know to, to the light uh, and, and they're important and, and we need to uh, um, to stay on top of them uh, but uh, what's critical for the stability of the state in the long run is whether these political processes that are meant to you know, you know, um, to negotiate how the state and society relate to each other how they 
move forward uh, will have uh, uh, the most lasting impact on, on uh, the stability of this country and, and whether they move towards a, a resilient and stable state or you know, uh, uh, something that uh, you know, is unfortunately you know, uh, much more challenged and uh, exclusionary and, and continues uh, to you know, not meet the needs of its citizens. So I would say these political processes are the most important.